Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is Rattlecast number 20. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, we have an excellent episode. Uh, when I was talking to somebody earlier about um, our guest today, they said, I didn't know you were going to have rock stars on your show. And uh, tonight we have a literary rock star for you in uh, Naomi Shihab Nye. We're really looking forward to that in about um, 14 minutes. So if you're uh, watching live or if you're watching archived, you can uh, skip ahead 14 minutes to uh, catch in with uh, Naomi Shihab Nye. We're looking forward to reading from her new book, The Tiny Journalist. But in the meantime, we're going to do a little pre-show where we kick back and relax, um, make sure everything's working right, which is always important, and um, enjoy a little bit of bonus poetry. Um, let's see. So last week on the Rattlecast, we uh, introduced a few of our um, Pushcart Prize nominees. And um, I thought we would finish out with um, two more. Uh, this poem was featured last Wednesday on Rattle.com. And um, Ukamaka Olasakwi is a... Uh, Let's see. She's had a work published in the New York Times, BBC, Jalada, Brittle Paper, and other literary journals. She was born in Kano, Nigeria, and currently is a candidate for the MFA in writing and publishing at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. She had a great little note, too. She said um, she writes poetry because it's the only language the girl she carries inside speaks. That was her contributor note for this poem. Um, and as always with the, with the uh, Pushcart nominations, we just look through and see which poems resonated with us, with us the most, which ones um, we still remember uh, a while later, and, um, and which ones resonated with our readers, which ones were shared the most. And this one, if you look up, uh, go to her, it was only posted last Wednesday. It already has uh, 659 shares on social media. So um, I, I made this choice before that even happened, but I could already tell based on um, the feedback I've gotten. A lot of people said that this was a standout poem for them. And... Um, I'm going to share it with you right now. This is, um, let's see, go over to, make sure you can see it. So let's do the document cam, actually. This is one of our six Pushcart Prize nominees. This is Ukamaka Olasakwi reading her prose poem, Slut. Slut. One. Grandmother said there is a slut trapped in every woman, a wild taboo that must never be set free. So mother dipped her fingers in a tub of pomade and massaged her daughter's clitoris until the puny thing grew thinner and disappeared into the fold of skin. Two. She packed up her books, took his name, and became dignified. Three. Perhaps in the next life she will come as a man. Perhaps she should make the best of this body. So she made her husband a pot of soup and prepared a table for him to eat. She laid back and watched him eat, and though his face was riddled with pleasure, she did not know the taste of her own food. Four. I stood under the shower, my breast drooping closer to my stomach, and I thought, oh, you sad things, it's too early to fall asleep. 5. There was a masseuse who lived down the street. Her fingers were sleek and long, body thin and shapely. One day, I stretched on the bed and let her hands walk my nerves, her fingers easing my knotted tension. I my slut stared, and I bit my tongue until I tasted my own blood. 6. Tell me how to make you happy, he said. Here, take my hand, speak with them. I don't know what happy is, I said. What does it taste like? Like the guavas after the rain had washed the trees of the Hamatan dust, or the Onubu soup after Mama had added clolops of ogiri? 7. Did I tell you about the girl who took a hammer to my slot cage and caused everything to fall apart? Sex had always been a ceremony for the man's orgasm. My hands were just tools to stir my husband's eagerness, my body his to devour. He would hover above me, face stretched in taut lines, 
sweat breaking from the side of his face and I would think, oh, you beautiful. How beautiful it is for this giant to quiver above me like the okra branch in the wind. And when he collapsed on my chest, I would hold him and think I had fulfilled my purpose. Because what else was the purpose of the woman than to keep her man satiated? Until Uneka, wild one, with a body that tapered like coke bottle, and limbs that stretched from heaven to earth. Uneka, with mouth that spat words like hot cones, her head filled with sin. She gazed at my cage, shook her head at my slot, and said, Chai, who did this to you? Then she picked at my lungs, tantric, fi tantric fingers exposing the other way of freedom, and I have never been the same again. 8. Grandmother looked at her daughter and said, This one is spoiled. Mother shook her head and said, Her cheese will come to slumber and this happened. Daughter strutted away a proud slut. 9. My husband used to joke about how docile I was before I joined the choir. One day, he paused between thrusts to trap my moons with the flat of his palm. Who are you? he asked. I have never seen you like this before. I beat his hand, threw my head back, forced him down, and he disappeared in between my thighs. He has yet to emerge ever since. So once again, that was uh, Ukamaka Olasaki from Rattle Number 65 with her Pushcart Prize-nominated poem, Slut. Um, and we have one more Pushcart Prize I was going to share with you. This was um, from issue number 63. And unlike uh, um, Ukamaka's poem... Al didn't include audio, so I'm going to have to read it, but that's the way we'll get it into the broadcast. This is uh, Al McGinnis's poem, Stern, which was um, our fifth Pushcart Prize nominee, I guess you could say. We've read five of them so far. And um, <clears throat> so Al is a um, author of several poetry collections, most recently The Next Place. He lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with his wife and daughter and teaches composition, literature, and creative writing at Wake Technical Community College. And this is another poem that, that um, at the time, there was a lot of um, really great response to. And it was a poem that really stood out as I was looking back through what we went over this year at our editorial meetings. This is Stern. The first poem I heard him read, this was on Bill Moyer's TV show about poetry, was The Dancing, about a family's unplanned twirl of ecstasy in the last year of World War II. The three of them, young Stern and his parents, not so young but younger, I bet than I am writing this, all dancing, the father using hand and armpits to squeeze out farting sounds, the three of them safe from the irreducibly and irreducibly caught in the wheel of history. From here, the cities of the 40s seem like benevolent wilderness that now exists only in myth, where men in loose clothes ro stroll the boulevards, wearing hats and ties, and women wear pencil skirts, everyone smoking, jazz rolled from some windows, symphony shrouded darker windows. Bars were filled with shadows, free of TV screens. Doors stood open because no one had air conditioning yet. I thought Stern's poem for a few semesters, I taught Stern's poem for a few semesters until two students who enrolled thinking it would be an easy A it was before I began teaching there demonstrated their arm fart technique for the class. This was at school for rich fuck-ups, many simply awaiting for the trust fund to begin paying off like a slot machine. But from them, a few emerged to love poems for at least a year. Still, the dancing never made the pirouette back into the rotation. If you teach, you know the drill. You learn which pieces will teach something and lean on those until they have no more to tell you, then find a, new, a few more. Or maybe you chose, choose a book or two each year and stumble through, never sure if you said anything worth saying. 25 years of five classes a semester, and I've learned which lessons I can trust. And my taste runs counter to my students, who are raptured by waterfalls, fields of green frosted by words worth daffodils, while I try to explain the blossoming joys of decay, of alleys through poor neighborhoods, the acne of rust on a car left abandoned on the highway. I never punched a clock in a coal, or coal or steel mill, I would sing a spot for them in the Pantheon as well. And the Pantheon, that endless mythical anthology, is where we all hoped to be going when we sat in workshops, then later in bars, basking in some small triumph or nursing wounds we would forget. It was the fall I got divorced, when a new professor handed back my poems and suggested I read Gerald Stern. 
advice I put aside with a lot of other good suggestions. It was a few years later, after school was done, that I heard Bill Moyers talk to Stern and went looking for his books. I was landscaping in the day and teaching composition at night. Somewhere I learned that he had spent years in community colleges, a fact that fills me with joy when there are papers to grade and poems that want to be written. The first time I saw Stern was at a writer's conference, as he moved slow as a planet amid a constellation of smaller poets. Heavy with mirth and awe, his face might have belonged to the deli owner who rings up your Reuben, or the ring watcher telling you that the middleweight who keeps dropping his left will never move up the card. Better dressed, he might have been the lawyer drafting the Talmudic passages, making it possible to leave your estate to your fat dog and not grandkids who never visit or call. I am old enough to have outlasted some of the world's fascination with youth. I can tell the students in my class, the Botox ladies where I buy groceries, that little runs as wild as an old man's heart. Those fires are the ones I need to keep this pen moving across the page. Tonight, somewhere north of me, I hope Stern is writing a poem. When I saw him read a few years ago, he talked about community colleges, and he signed his book, Your Fellow Slave, though it's been years since he was a slave to any job. I left the reading grateful for the angels of poetry, who come on half-sprained wings to bless all that rusts and ages, who come to us when we are wild enough to dance. And that was Alan McGinnis reading his poem, Stern. Well, that was me reading Alan, McGin Alan McGinnis' poem, Stern, one of our Pushcart Prize nominees for 2019. Um... I thought it was a great poem, too, for, for this episode, because today uh, Naomi is one of our angels who um, come to us when we were wild enough to dance. And um, but that's from issue rattle number 63. Um, let's see, how much time do we have left? Well, we're starting, and I was going to do an open mic poem, but I think we will uh, skip right to Naomi now. We have two minutes to go until I bring her in. Um, I'm trying something a little bit new, so if you're watching this live, let me know if the connection is a little spotty. I have a third camera going, so there's a lot of video flying around my computer right now, so that Naomi can actually see me as we talk, which um, in the past guests haven't been able to do. Um, so I should say for now, Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been a continued this publication since 1995, and um, we're just here because we love poems, and um, hope you do too. Um, so I'm just going to step away for one minute, and then we'll bring in Naomi and uh, talk about her book. So looking forward to that. I'll see you in just a minute. So uh, we have um, we have Naomi Shihab Nye on the line. Uh, Naomi is um, really one of my favorite poets. Um, we interviewed her for Rattle Number Twenty One way back in the day. She's won pretty much every award and fellowship you possibly could. She's the current Children's Poet Laureate of the United States. Her most recent book, which came to me um, by surprise, is um, the Tiny Journalist, which is a collection of poems about. Um, a young journalist in Palestine, and um, we're really, really thankful to have her on the show today. Um, here she is, Naomi Shihab Nye. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Tim. It's so great to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's so great to have you. I'm so glad you could do this. My pleasure. And, and you're, you're in San Antonio, Texas, right? 
That's right. Downtown, old San Antonio, by the river. Yes. Uh-huh. That's great. Um, do you want to read one poem, sort of kick us off, and then we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit? Sure. And Tim, I'm really a fan of all you do. So thank you for... Thank you for your great spirit with poetry. Oh, th- thank you. It's just my pleasure. It's, you know, it's fun for us. I never thought I'd have this job, but now that I do, uh, it's, a great, it's a great job to have. So here's a, it's kind of an introductory poem describing to your listeners who Jenna is. She is, uh, I'll tell more about her in a minute. Okay, Jenna. At seven, making videos. At 10, raising the truth flag. At 11, raising it higher, traveling to South Africa, Kafia nodded on shoulders, interviews in airports. Please, could you tell us? You know, gazing into a camera can be a bridge, so you stare without blinking. People drift to the sides of the film, don't want to be noticed, put on the spot. You know the only thing that matters. What else? Long days, tired trousers pinned on roof lines, nothing good expected. It's right in front of me. I didn't go looking for it. I'm living in the middle of trouble. No reason not to say it straight. They do not consider us equal. They blame us for everything, forgetting what they took, how they took it. We are made of both and flesh and story, but they poke their big guns into our faces and our front doors and our living rooms as if we are vapor. Why can't they see how beautiful we are? The saddest part? We all could have had twice as many friends. And that was uh, Jana from this book um, from from Boa Press, The Tiny Journalist. Um, so, so Naomi, can you explain who Jenna is? And um, I'm really curious how you got to know about her. I think I read, I'm not sure if it was in the book, um, but I read somewhere that you only have a Facebook account so you could follow Jenna. Um, so how did you come across her? That's and um, and just explain who she is for people who don't know. Well, she's, um, she's very young. She's only 13 at the moment. But when she was six and seven, she decided... Uh, living in the West Bank in Palestine, she decided that there weren't enough journalists present uh, showing and documenting what was happening to Palestinian people on a a regular basis. And I I actually can't remember where I first heard about her. There has been a short Academy Award-nominated film uh, about her called uh, Radiance of Resistance, but it's only about minutes long. But but I knew about her before that film, so I don't know where I first heard about her. Hmm. But she uh, she lives in this village where her family is, and it's very near the village where my own grandmother, Palestinian grandmother and relatives lived, um, and and died. Many most of them died. Um, but when I heard about where she was exactly and what she was doing, I was very interested in her. So her her. Full name is Jana Jihad Ayad Tamimi. She's from the Tamimi family, and uh, her her activism started with taking pictures with a phone, and then it has carried on to involve trips out of the country, speaking tours. This past summer, she went on a speaking tour in the United States. Now, think about it. She's only thirteen. What were you doing when you were thirteen? Um, it's kind of amazing to consider a child who feels the driven responsibility and desire to communicate uh, her people's situation. So as a half Palestinian and uh, the daughter of a father who was advocating for justice his entire life, I became very interested in her. It was like she was the next generation. She was the person with the iPhone, the high tech possibility of or maybe not an iPhone, but some kind of phone, of transmitting what she witnessed. So I became a fan. Mm-hmm. I'm very grateful to Jana for what she's doing. Yeah, and, and I think um, if I, I read right, um, there's a famous photo that, that a lot of people might have seen of um, a, a um, family fighting an Israeli soldier. 
and one of the one of the kids is biting the arm. Well, a little girl is biting the arm of the Israeli soldier, and that's Jenna's older sister, right? Is, if I remember right. Um, I believe it's her cousin. Oh, her cousin. Ahed, yeah. Her cousin and Ahed to Mimi, her cousin, who's about seventeen or eighteen right now. She went to to jail at the age of sixteen mm -hmm. for slap slapping a soldier. Yeah, in that same who, incident, right? Yeah, 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 I think yeah. If that's the incident yeah. you're talking about. So Ahed became um, more widely known around the world because she herself went to jail. And, you know, you have to ask yourself if somebody trundled into your house with a large weapon and shot one of your family members, um, what are the chances you might slap them at least? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah. I would certainly try to distract them from what they were doing. So um, what Jenna is living through is not, and that's the tragedy about it. What she is witnessing is what I witnessed as a teenager living in the West Bank, what my father witnessed as a boy. Uh, well, he was a little older when um, his family became refugees. He was 19 and 20 when that happened. But, um, you know, this is not an isolated occurrence. It is status quo and we are paying for it as Americans. Mm -hmm. So I feel it's my yeah. duty as a half American, half Palestinian, to talk about it. You know, it's not like a luxury. It's not the most fun thing to talk about. But as a poet, if I didn't give voice to some this ad advocacy, I would feel as if I weren't doing mm -hmm. my job. Yeah, and, and reading the book, um, I, I feel like I have a nine-year-old daughter. And so, you know, you know the, the Palestinian conflict is something that is sort of in the news and everybody thinks about and has opinions about. But poetry is an amazing way to, you know, they're like, you know, poems I always say are little empathy machines. And, and to put yourself in the place of Jana and her family um, and imagine my own daughter, who's nine right now, being in these kind of circumstances. Right. It's hard to read the book without you know, getting, getting teary eyed because, um, they're really moving poems and really hard, hard situation to, um, to deal with. Well, I, I'm very touched that you think of your own daughter because I think most people in mo most people in any country have a, a kind of a, a natural impulse to, to want to protect their own home, their own children, their, their neighbors, their, extended family, their community. I mean, we have this protective instinct. And uh, so why that's n not easier for, for Americans to understand when they hear about the situation in Israel-Palestine is um, has always been hard for me to, to grasp. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, so so um, I just want to say for everybody at home, if you have any questions for at Naomi Shihab Nye about this book or anything else, um, just leave them on the chat and I can pass them along. I like this to be as interactive as possible because um, we're all just hanging out, enjoying poetry and, and poetry that's important and uh, meaningful to our lives. So um, if you'd like to you know, pass, have any questions or um, comments, do, uh, do share them in the chat window on YouTube if you're watching live and I'll pass them along to Naomi. Um, Naomi, do you want to read a few more poems, maybe like a, a three or so? And Sure. Okay. Um, I love I love what you said about poetry being an empathy machine. That's beautiful. Um, separation wall. When the milk is sour, it separates. The next time you stop speaking, ask yourself why you were born. They say they are scared of us. The nuclear bomb is scared of the cucumber. When my mother asks me to slice cucumbers, I feel like a normal person with fantastic dilemmas. Do I make rounds or sticks? Shall I trim the seeds? I ask my grandmother if there was ever a time she felt like a normal person every day, not in danger, and she thinks for as long as it takes a sun to set and says, yes, I always feel like a normal person. They just don't see me as one. We would like the babies not to find out about the failures waiting for them. I would like them to believe on the other side of the wall is a circus that just hasn't opened yet. Our friends learning how to juggle, to walk on tall poles. And this is called, and that mysterious word, holy. 
because of course many people call Jerusalem the Holy Land or the whole region the Holy Land. That is on page 32. You might as well take a rotten lemon, squeeze it in your hand. Let the juice trickle down your wrist and arm, sharp bite of acidity, prickling your scratches and scars, and say, I bow down to you. When the almond tree erupts into blossom without help from any people, I bow down. Here we are in the land of sacred story, chant, shrines, altars and grottos, parables, and soldiers in camouflage are carrying guns. What does that say about holy? How much power it doesn't have. Thou shalt not kill, crumpled under our feet. Whose religion would you follow? And why do they wear camouflage? We can still see them. Who are they hiding from? The guns are bigger than we are. The tanks are bigger than shrines. Tear gas canisters, grenade casings, littering graves of our ancestors in the cemetery. I bow down. You bow to the big shining platter everyone eats off together. Sit in a circle for your holy rice. Speak after me. Holy eggplant, my best angel. And this poem is called, Sometimes There is a Day. Sometimes there is a day you just want to get so far away from. Feel it shrink inside you like an island, as if you were on a boat. I always wish to be on a boat. Then, maybe, no more fighting about land. I want that day to feel as if it never happened, when Ahmed was burned, when people were killed, when my cousin was shot. The day someone went to jail is not a day that shines. I want to have a clear mind again, as a baby who stares at the light, wisping through the window and thinks, that's mine. Um, so the, the, the sense of, of um, her advocacy is really what, what gave me my engine mm -hmm. through the making of this book. Um, I have never met her. We have messages to one another, but uh, we've never met in person. And um, I've heard, though, that if someone approaches her, like when she was on her speaking tour with this book, she signs mm -hmm. it, which made me very happy. And she should. It's beautiful. And all the proceeds are hers. Oh, really? So, uh, oh, yeah. Yes. 100%. So um, there's a feeling to me that I, I wanted to honor her voice. I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to pr pretend that it was me, but, but I say in the introduction that there are these layers of voices. Um, that, that the generations by now who have suffered the same sorrowful story and, uh, and, and tried to, you know, maintain some dignity and some sanity in the face of so much insult and injustice. And really, Tim, um, I talked to so many Americans who go on a tour to the holy places or to Israel, Palestine, you know, they go on their special tours with a group by themselves and many times I'll just say, keep your eyes open. I want you to call me when you get back. Tell me who you met, what you saw, how it went. And just make sure you talk to some Palestinians too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. always they come back in some kind of shock about what they have experienced. Um, it's not anything that we're making up. It's not uh, a fantasy. It is a really grim situation for thousands and thousands of people and hundreds of thousands, you know, millions in exile. It's a very big and ongoing story. Now I do have a little, two little bits of good news. Um, a retired, a, a retired rabbi sent me uh, an email yesterday about this 
inaugural gathering in London uh, of a group called the Arab Council for Regional Integration. And Israelis attended, Arabs from many different countries attended. And the whole idea is that all of this separation hasn't worked very well. So they have to figure out some new strategies for working together. And of course, that's not a new thought, but at least they're taking some action. And also last week in the Palestinian town of Ramallah, there was a very large gathering um, in which many Israelis decided to come to this Arab town and participate. And it was kind of a first in Ramallah to have, I think, this many people gathered um, in an Arab-hosted meeting. But these seem like good signs to me. Of course, along the way, there have been so many Arab and Jewish people who would much prefer to be friends rather than enemies. So many of them are my close friends. And uh, so many of them find one another everywhere. And it's such a tragedy that that the situation has separated them more than any brother, sister group of people, you know, really should be separated. They're all Semites. Um, you know, you can't say, oh, if you're pro-Palestinian, you're anti-Semitic, because Palestinians are Semites also. So, you know, you could say, wait a minute, the Israelis have been anti-Semitic against the other Semites for all these years. Um, so people need to keep talking about it because if we allow the big money, the power mongers, uh, the greed, the politicians, uh, quite a few of whom are under indictment at the moment of some kind or another, um, if we allow them to own the entire story, it's as if we're not uh, respecting all the stories of the regular human beings, the kids, the grandmas, the people who go to work every day, who cook dinner, who wash clothes. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do in this book. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for people's responses to the book so far. Could I, could I tell you my best response I've had? This one was, it, is it okay if I yeah, tell you? Yeah, please do. Yeah. So I was at a writer's conference in another city and a woman came up to me when I was clearing out of the room where I'd done a little talk. And she came up to me with a, kind of an odd look on her face, and she said, uh, I am so-and-so, I'm a big supporter of Israel, and I went over to the book table, and I saw your book, and I picked it up, and I saw what it was about, and I thought, well, I'm not getting this book. I don't want this book. And she said, but for some reason, I just stood there at the book table, and I read the first half of the book, and I knew that every word you were saying was true. So I had to buy your book and I'm not happy about it. And I said, that may be the best review I ever get. Um, that, that kind of ties into something I wanted to ask about. Um, and, it, and it's a question that somebody sort of ties in who has someone called image last people use um, handles sometimes instead of uh, their names. I don't know who that is, but uh, image last says in today's cancel culture, how essential is the theme of intelligent kindness or compassion in poetry? And just tying into that, um, like, has there been negative feedback for this book? I mean, it's such a, it's such a hot button issue. You know, I think um, some people, I don't know if they're watching now, are probably thinking along the lines of what that woman thought. Um, you know, I uh, one time I um, during one of the um, during one of the um, assaults on. Um, um, on um, Gaza, I, I changed. It was that time where people were changing their Facebook images to like the um, French flag for for um, you know Je suis whatever that was, um, and and so I changed it to the Palestinian flag for just a day, just to sort of raise awareness of what was going on there because it wasn't in the news at the time. And I have a lot of hate mail just over doing that tiny gesture. So I was wondering if if there's been pushback to that. There's also a poem in your book. Um, I think it's, I have to paraphrase it, but an administrator is talking to you and saying, um, you know, in, in this age of social media and whatnot, don't talk about the president. Um, so, yeah. so, so has there been, was there a hesitancy to publish this book in the first place? And has there been any negative response? And um, what do you think in the face of that? Well, thank you for that question. And the administrator you're referring to in the book is referring to the American president, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. not any in Israel or Palestine. But it's the same kind of um, sense of, you know, um, of, of um, 
but censorship it, and, yeah. and pushback against the social media mobs or whatever you might want to call them. Yeah, fearsome, you know, it's it, it's fearing, you know, we don't want to have any negativity stirred up, so say nothing. Um, you know, I will cherish Peter Connors, my editor at BOA, for not having uh, any trepidation at all, to my knowledge, about publishing this book. He stood by it from the first moment he heard about it, he wanted to do it, he has supported it. Um, he's been incredible. He's just a terrific editor. And I love Boa. This is my fifth book with Boa. So we're old friends by now. Um, but also, I asked Peter recently, I was up in Rochester for a benefit uh, for Boa. And I asked him, have you seen bad reviews? Because I don't go, I'm not a person who Googles myself and I don't go searching for bad reviews. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. But you know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm real, I'm I haven't seen them any and if they're out there he hasn't seen them either so um you know maybe i'll now be stimulating people to write them <laughs> bad ones but i hope not but um but, but i i appreciate um anyone like the woman who has a reluctance to listen to the whole the fuller story the dialogue part of it you know the other people in the story and the fact that she would go ahead and buy the book and then come seek me out to tell me that um, suggests to me that I think we all do have a better a better impulse to want to to understand, to kind of calibrate our thinking, not be mm -hmm. so one yeah. way only. Um, I hope I hope a lot of people do. I've had um, many very uh, beautiful responses to the book. Last week it was named by the Washington Post as one of the best poetry books of the year. And that meant a lot to me, along with my friends Jericho Brown, Ilya Kaminsky, and a few other people. Um, but um, I'm, I'm just grateful to anyone who reads it, much less, you know, singles it out. Yeah. And do you, do you think poetry yeah. is sort of a way to build bridges through that? I, I, I was reminded of um, Alicia Porat is a Jewish poet um, living in a kibbutz in Israel. Um, he died maybe 10 years ago, but we published a poem I always think about called um, Painful Birds. And he calls the helicopters flying over on the West Bank painful birds. And, and he talks about his sadness dealing with, you know, that constant strife and all the terrible things that happen. Um, do you think poetry is a way to build bridges? Like, do you have any interaction with Israeli poets um, in a way that's productive and maybe offers a hope of a road out? Um, yes, over the years I have had a lot of interaction with them. Hannah Block was someone who was a great poet herself. She was a translator, lived in California, translated uh, contemporary Israeli poets, uh, Yehuda Amahai, Dalia Ravikovich. Um, I did love Hannah. We did presentations together. Um, and people afterwards were, would say interesting things to us like, you two seem pretty much on the same beam. And well, yeah, we're on the beam of let's figure this out. Let's share. Let's have cooperation. Let's not have a dominant uh, group of people and then a, a subpar group of people who have no rights, no human rights, uh, no decency offered to them by the status quo government. So um, Hana was a friend. I had a chance to meet Yehuda Amakai and go to his house in Jerusalem and um had a very moving, moving conversation with him. And so many Jewish poets are have been my friends and we've participated in, um, you know, many, many groups over the years. Um, my, some of my books have been translated into Hebrew. Actually, it's ironic, more of my books have been translated into Hebrew than into Arabic. Oh, wow. Um, I think people who speak Arabic say, oh, we'll just read it in English because they usually speak English too. But um, they're smarter than I am. But I have had books uh, translated by uh, Hebrew poets, Israeli poets into, into Hebrew and a novel and a book of poems. Anyway, yes, I try, to, I try to maintain a sense of bridging the gap as a poet, as a human being, I mean, obviously, I'm not a politician. I'm just a regular person. And I see no reason for um, so many people to keep suffering in a world where better arrangements could be made. And I really don't think it would take 
that imagination to figure out something better. I respect um, the educator, uh, Dr. Sari Nuseba, very much, a Palestinian professor of philosophy, actually. And he used to say, I actually got to hear him speak in person once and read his books. He used to say, people need to take a big leap. Um, you need to make, take a leap and then figure out how we got there and then fill in the gaps. You know, but we can't just keep going back and forth like, you did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you, so you're going to do that to me. And that really made a lot of sense to me. Also, I think poetry is a genre which embraces leaping. You know, the poetic leap uh, to something different in the poem, to another image, to another place. Um, so I think poetry can be helpful. I know that I know that I have expanded my own view of uh, many perspectives in the world, not just in terms of uh, the Middle East, but by reading poets from the regions. So, yeah, I think it's important that we read each other and poetry being a genre short enough that, you know, you could have some doses of it and have some thoughts of your own and um, maybe create some new thinking. Well, great. Thank you. Do you want to read a few more uh, poems, um, maybe two or three, and then we'll do one more little round of questions if anybody has any more from the audience? Okay. And just let me know the page numbers because I don't know what you're going to be reading. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, 68. This okay. is Mediterranean Blue. If you are the child of a refugee, you do not sleep easily when they are crossing the sea on small rafts and you know they can't swim. My father couldn't swim either. He swam through sorrow, though, and made it to the other side on a ship pushing his old clothes overboard at landing, then tried to be happy, make a new life. But something inside him was always paddling home, clinging to anything that floated, a story, a food, or face. They are the bravest people on earth right now. Don't dare look down on them. Each mind a universe swirling as many details as yours as much love for a humble place. Now the shirt is torn, the sea too wide for comfort, and nowhere to receive a letter for a very long time. And if we can reach out a hand, we better. And this poem is on page 82. It's called In Some Countries. There were people who had a hundred handbags, people who hired maids to take care of their maids. You could float down the Rhine and see castles. Dogs wore coats for daily walks in Central Park. A dog's diamond collar glistened. We were not dreaming of these things for ourselves. We needed basics, starting small. Hello, you look like a human being to me. It's hard to know what open roads mean if you've always had them. We can't imagine the luxury of open roads. So those are two more poems from the tiny journalist. Um, Jamal Udin uh, has a question. He says, are there any poems of outrage in this book? Um, do you think, would you consider any poems poems of outrage? Yes, I hope so. I would. Um, but I tried to temper outrage with, um, well, yeah, no, I would say definitely outrage, but also with grief and with sorrow because you don't just have anger by itself. You have, you know, a whole legacy, a residue of, you know, your father's entire life, your grandmother's entire life, everything she lost, um, you know, an entire family, your uncle who died because he wasn't allowed to go to hospital because he didn't have a a pass to cross through the checkpoint. And his famous last words were, next time I'll plan it better. Hmm. You know, so yeah, there's, I've written about these things all my life. Those are very personal things to me and my family. But in, in this book for Jenna and for her advocacy, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, collectively, uh, kind of an outrage that this sort of 
injustice has been allowed to continue so long. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe sort of move move topics a little bit. Um, Joshua Corwin asks um, what your editing process is like, and um, oh. how do you work with your own personal slush pile, as he calls it, um, when you're reviewing <laughs> your works ob objectively after you've taken time away from the piece. So how do you, how do you move through n knowing what to publish and what not? That's a good question. Yeah, well, it's a great question, and you know, we all have slush piles that are good friends. I keep them in like baskets on shelves under my desk here and there. Um, I was going through a bunch today, so the question makes me laugh. But, um, you know, I, I like to write freely. Maybe I overwrite initially and then start trimming back, start finding out, okay, this is a room. I only want the essential furniture in it. Where's the, where's the poem? Where's the real poem? Necessary poem. And then cutting things out. So I urge students to write more than they think they'll need not to try to be too particular and precise in the early drafts because then you often get frustrated and stuck. And I think it's better to have too much and cut back. So I'm always, you know, working on poems, moving things around, shaping them. Um, yeah, I, I think I try to have a friendly relationship with revision. Um, you know, it's just something that we do and we do it a lot as writers. So, you know, to have the initial writing is, one kind of burst of energy and then the later writing when we go back and we have a more editorial eye and tip our heads and slash new lines um a different eye but you know i try to keep a very positive relationship with all of it because it's all part of the of the process yeah and um i still like to do a lot by hand you know i'm an old-fashioned person so i use a computer but i still like writing by hand by hand. Uh, let me ask you a, a sort of related question. I think um, I think uh, your poem "Gate A 4 is probably um, the poem of the decade. I would say of the of that year, you know that decade it came out ten years ago or however many years ago it came out post nine eleven. Um, it was really a, a poem that connected so many people and became viral. I think probably before that was a word. Uh, <laughs> Do, do, do you, oh. um, how does it feel to, you know, that's sort of every poet's goal is to have a poem like that that resonates with so many people. Um, do, do you have a sense of that? Oh. How does it feel? And um, did you know that it was well, going to happen before it did? You know, I didn't know. Of course I didn't know. But, um, you know, I knew it was a magic, a magical evening. I knew that I had to write about it. I wrote, I wrote the rough draft of that piece that night uh, when I got home from my flight. And, you know, every time I walk through the Albuquerque airport ever since, I blow a kiss to gate A4 hmm. because I do feel that that piece has found friends and I'm very grateful. People write to me all the time about it. I'm, I'm very touched. That piece and the poem Kindness, which was written even longer ago, um, have been probably my two pieces that traveled around the most and had their own bigger lives the most. And it's intriguing to me because both of them, came out of experiences of friction and disarray. Um, you know, kindness came out of being robbed of everything on our honeymoon, and then Gate A4 came out of this woman sobbing on the floor in an airport. So um, I guess I go back to counsel I had when I was very young. You know, use your troubles. Use your frictions. That's a good place to start your writing. Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, that woman's, it wasn't my trouble. It was her misunderstanding, but... Uh, to be part of the story, to step in and then feel how her story kept growing and the ripples around her kept getting stronger and more radiant. It was it was a truly beautiful event. And and th uh, so those those both those poems were based on real events. Then I always kind of wondered that they they really happened. Oh, yeah. yeah, completely one hundred percent nonfiction. You know, and recently I had occasion to um, I had to spend the night in JFK airport, you know, one of those nights where you're stretched out on the floor with your bag. And, um, cause, of, and I just kept thinking, you know, it was, it was a very, it felt very tender to me because I think of airports as these magical places where, where things can happen that really change your world. And I, I did feel even sleeping on the floor of that airport, um, that I had a sense of the underpinning of lives 
and uh, you know the janitorial crew at night and the security people who are there all night and then who come in so early in the morning and just the whole the rhythm happen being a your your own sense of pain and so when you have things happen that aren't you know your chosen things there's this little part of you that's the eye standing back watching thinking you know what's here what's here that's going to stay with me in the story or the image you know what and and i think that's a gift of being a poetry writer and reader because readers have that gift too to notice things in that way mm -hmm. it's interesting too that both poems are sort of you know born out of suffering but then build bridges and it, and i hadn't really thought of it yet yep. until just now but that's sort of what you do with all of your work i'd say um you know you kind of you find find friction and then find a way to to heal the wound that the friction is is under very often well thank you tim for saying that i guess that is sort of my unstated motto that you know in life we're going to have friction we're going to have rough stuff every day and what are we going to do with it? Where do we put it? How do we, how do we move through it and from it? Yeah. Um, do you want to read a, a few more poems? I don't know if you want to go back to this book or, or read other things. Um, whatever you want to do no, is up to you. We have about ten, staying... 10 minutes left or eight minutes or so. So. Okay. I'll read, um, I'll read two more poems from this book and then see if you want to talk. Yeah, okay. great. Just say the page numbers okay. again so I can show them. Oh, yeah. Page 10. Okay. Uh, page 10. It was or it wasn't. Arabic fairy tales begin this way. So do Arabic days. A pantry is empty, but Mama still produces a tray of tea and cookies for the guest. West is still the way we stare, knowing there's blue space and free water over there. There's a Palestinian and a Jew building a synagogue together in Arkansas. They're friends with respect. Actually, our water isn't free either, nor are the fish my friends in Gaza aren't allowed to catch. It was or it wasn't a democracy, a haven for human beings, but only some of them. You can't do that with people, pretend they aren't there. It was or it wasn't a crowd, diploma, marriage, legacy, babies being born, children being killed. It was or it wasn't going to work out. Um, and I urge um, people, if they look at, at Jenna's site, her Facebook site, I urge, look up the story of Ahmed, because Ahmed is a, a child, I think he's a relative, a, co a cousin, another cousin of Jenna's, um, or at least a boy in the village, something very terrible happened to. And um, so I, re I refer to him a few times in this book, uh, but he's worth knowing about. Shadow, and this is on page 42. Some people feel lost inside their days always waiting for worse to happen. They make bets with destiny. My funniest uncle gave up cursing bad words inside his head. He says he succeeded one whole hour. He tried to unsubscribe to the universe made by people. He slept outside by himself on top of the hill. When Facebook says I have followers, I hope they know I need their help. Subscribe to plants, animals, stars, music, the baby who can't walk yet, but stands up holding on to the sides of things, tables, chairs, and takes a few clumsy steps, then sits down hard. This is how we live. So that was Shadow from Naomi's new book, The Tiny Journalist. Um, Naomi... Um, David Cook asks, and I don't know if there's a connection here or not, but he asks, um, what is your favorite Stafford poem, um, and how has Bill Stafford influenced you? Um, I didn't know he was an influence, so. Oh, he was my biggest influence. Oh, okay. And thank you, David Cook, for asking that question. 
Um, you know, I have so many favorite Stafford poems, and I turn to them, uh, all different ones, all the time. I, I've probably read aloud that poem he wrote very close before his death, the one called um, You Reading This, Be Ready. I've probably read it aloud in the most classes because it's such a call to a witness, to observation. But I do feel what I learned from Stafford was everything. I feel I learned um, a, a kind of, of faith in language that if you embark on a project with words and you trust in them and you keep going back to them, they will take you somewhere. They may teach you something you didn't even know you knew or needed to know. Uh, I take from him uh, a sense that life is brimming on all sides, is absolutely brimming with worthy uh, places for our attention. And the sense that every voice matters and that we are here to encourage one another in all the ways we can. And poetry is here to encourage us in all the ways we need it. So I urge everybody who hasn't read William Stafford poems to go find them. You can go to the Lewis and Clark Library digital Stafford site um, or buy his books, check his books out. Um, he will give you a comfort that is uh, one of the greatest comforts I've ever known through poetry. And his poems were not as as easy and as simple as some people may have felt upon first readings, because some of his poems I've been reading now for 40 years, 30 years, and I keep finding new things in them. And I think this is really an amazing poem, because it keeps growing. Or is it that I've kept growing? We've all kept growing. And so we now relate in different ways. But please, everybody, read William Stafford. I do appreciate so much that he was a conscientious objector and a pacifist, and he abhorred violence of all kinds and war. And um, he was a great, great spirit of the 20th century. I miss him so much. Well, thanks, David. That's a great, great answer. Um, before before we uh, move on a little bit, let me just say to everybody, if you uh, are enjoying this uh, live stream, please do click the like button. We've got you know, 30 people watching live and only four likes. So click that like button. It really helps out. Make sure you're subscribed. If you're watching this after the fact, subscribe over um, iTunes or wherever you're listening on Facebook. Make sure you're following our page because we do this once a week and it's a lot of fun. We have a new guest every Tuesday night. Um, so Naomi, let me ask you one more question then maybe finish off with one more poem. Um, so you're the Children's Poet Laureate, which is something we haven't, haven't talked about yet. But, but what do you do in that role and... What does it mean to you to um, write for children, which is something I think um, is a really magical thing that, that, that us poets as a community don't appreciate enough, I think. You know, reading, reading you know, Dr. Seuss to my kids is one of the great joys of life, and it means so much to their development. And it's not something that a lot of poets do, write things for children. Um, so I, you've written a bunch of books um, for, for children and teenagers. Um, so, so how do you think of that in... in just what do you have to say about, about it? Well, I'm very honored. They call it the Young People's Poet Laureate. It's through the Poetry Foundation of Chicago. I'm very honored they selected me. Uh, what I do is do different kinds of appearances and events um, with young people, which is what I've done my entire adult life. So it's that's like carrying on with what I, what I do. Um, I'm also... Uh, posting a few things now and then on their Twitter page and keeping a page of book recommendations on the Poetry Foundation site. Uh, but I, I think, you know, because I fell in love with poetry as a child, and I liked all kinds of poems. I didn't just like poems that were written for children. I liked Emily Dickinson, William Blake, Carl Sandburg when I was a child, uh, Walt Whitman. You know, I can do a whole string of people I was reading when I was seven years old. And... Um, because of that, you know, I don't see a huge boundary line between the worlds of poetry for adults and poetry for children. But I have um, enjoyed writing poems with that younger audience in mind. I think they're kind of native poets. They they speak poetry um, often, not realizing it. And so just to be in their midst or to direct works toward that reading age is an enormous, enormous pleasure. Yeah, yeah, we um, have, a, love, um, we publish a... I love, 
Yeah. Yeah, we publish a Young Poets yeah, anthology um, yeah. with every, um, you know, every, once a year. I think we've we've done seven of them or so. It's poets age 15 and younger. And the just fascinating They're thing just, is that they um, yeah. are natural poets until around the age of 13 or 12 or 11. Then it becomes seems it becomes really challenging because they become self-conscious. And um, but but as young people, I feel like we're natural poets. It's kind of, it's in our DNA through evolutionary biology to tell stories this way and sing songs at the same time. And, um, and I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so it's great that you do that too. Well, I urge um, everybody to, to check out books of poems that are intended for children, because I think as adults, you also will like them very much um, and be surprised by how much is out there that speaks to you too. Um, and Kim Tedro, Kim Tedro asks, sort of related, um, uh, she says she loves that uh, your poetry teaches me how good, engaging, and effective poetry is written. What do you tell your students about writing political poetry? So maybe ties it back into the book. Right, yeah. Well, I think if you're writing about something political, you know, to try to uh, keep it uh, attached, to, keep it kind of human-sized, versus just spouting, this is wrong, this is terrible, this is horrible, we shouldn't do this, kind of keep it in the realm that we live in, like the dailiness, the, the, I guess that's why I wanted Jenna's voice, her perspective, a child's perspective. You know, I'm exhausted with the adult perspective on this sad saga. Let's hear, how, let's imagine what somebody else might see or think about. Um, so I try to keep it human-sized, and I would say, you know, find some way for any political issue that you can have a particular a link to that larger topic mm -hmm. something that's mm -hmm. particular to you it doesn't have to be about you but it has a handle for you to speak about so so you can write about it more compellingly so i think i'll close uh tim and thank you so much for your interest and for letting me be on your show oh, it's really our pleasure to have you uh the poem on page 20 called Exotic Animals Book for Children. Um, by the way, this is a common question I'm asked in the Middle East because kids know I live in Texas, so they always want to know if I've ever seen an armadillo. Armadillo means little armored one. Some of us become this to survive in our own countries. I would like to see an armadillo crossing the road. Our armor is invisible. It polishes itself. We might have preferred to be a softer animal, wouldn't you? With fur and delicate paws, like an African striped grass mouse, also known as zebra mouse. Great poem, Abe, and a great way great. to end it. Uh, once again, we are uh, reading, this is Nomi Shihab Nai, reading from The Tiny Journalist, her new book out from BOA. You can find it anywhere books are sold, but it's always best if you go to BOA, boaeditions.org and buy it directly from the publisher. Um, Naomi, thanks so much for joining us. This has been really, really illuminating and um, a pleasure talking to you. Uh, it really means a lot that you that come on here and, and um, test out this, this Skype radio reading kind of concept. My pleasure, Tim, and thank you for Rattle and for all the great work you've done all these years with poetry. Oh, it means so much to all of us. Definitely. My pleasure. Ha a have lot. a great night. You too. Bye. 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 So that was Naomi Shihab Nye uh, reading from her book, The Tiny Journalist, which um, I highly recommend. It's a really, you know, whether however you feel about the politics of the Middle East, it's a book that um, will really make you um, see the whole picture in a new way and, um, and, and feel a lot of um, empathy for, for what's going on there. Just imagining living in a situation like that on either side of the, of the walls um, is an important thing to do. So, um, so thanks so much to Naomi Shihab Nye for joining us. And um, we're going to go to the open mic in just a second. So I am going to... I'm sorry to put the music on. didn't even know it. I'll turn that up. I'm going to go to the open mic for in just a minute, and um, we will uh, be back in a second with uh, the open mic, and I'll see you soon.
Okay, so I'm back. Oops, I turned my... Oh, I turned the wrong volume down. There we go. Okay, so I'm back. And um, we're going to do some open mic. I had to pull up the, the pre-recorded poems first before I could show them to you. So that was the that's why we do a little bumper there. Um, let me turn this off. Uh, so if you'd like to call in, uh, you can do it now. Either send me a chat message to Rattle Poetry on Skype or um, let me uh, put up the, uh, hang on one second, there's the phone number. The phone number is 818-850-7727 if you'd like to call in. If you catch me at a time like this, where I'm in between callers or, or poems, um, I'll just answer. If you um, don't, I'll call you back as soon as there's an opening. Uh, if you want to call in now, that's 818-850-7727. Skype is even better, though. Um, if you Skype in, it's Rattle Poetry. Send me a chat message, and I will call you when the time is right over Skype. Um, if you do the phone option, um, try to read a poem that's already online somewhere, and then you can give me really quick the... Um, the uh, URL of that poem, I can Google it, or you know, just with a title, and we can put that on screen uh, so everybody can read along, and you don't have to just look at my face as we read poems, because nobody wants to do that. I know. Um, so let's do an open mic poem first. We have to have Joshua Corwin wants to call in again. He's a regular on the uh, on Skype, so it's great to see him. Um, this first poem. This first one was Mad Weather. There's sort of a theme going on here. Uh, you'll, you'll see soon. It's just what happened to come up. These are open mics. I don't prepare them at all. Um, but this is Mad Weather by Sarah Lipton. Sarah Lipton was born in London, England. She's written short stories, poetry, and a children's book, among other things. Um, she's uh, working on her first novel. And her first collection of poetry is out called The First Collection by Jericonda Books. It's coming out in the spring of 2020. This poem is called Mad Weather. At first, I wish to... Oops, that was the wrong poem. Hang on. Mad weather. Spring, summer, autumn, and winter seem to have disappeared. The flies arrive in February, and it seems so weird. Animals have woken from hibernation. Birds twitter in the trees. Bees buzz from flower to flower. This is so strange to me as it's happening in the winter. The temperature soars to 72 degrees. The sun dazzles in the sky. I have to wear my summer clothes, but in December? I don't know why. January is like June. June is like January. There is snow in July and sunshine in February. There is no longer fog in November, but bright, sunny days. There is never snow for Christmas. Oh, I wish I was far away. In 1987, the wind came in October rather than March. A lack of rain in winter has left the land parched. I have to go to a country where the seasons have remained, where there's snow in winter and sunshine in summer, as I really don't like change. This poem is from the first collection, and my volume of poetry the first collection will be published by jacaranda books in the spring of 2020 yeah so that was sarah lipton from london england reading mad weather thanks so much for sharing that if anybody would like to um uh, pre-record a poem all you have to do is go to rattle.com slash rattlecast you can find the link there to the uh, submittable page where you just submit, all you do is submit an audio file and the text, and then I can put the, the poem on the screen and play the audio. Uh, I go through everybody, and we're kind of caught up. We have about, um, I think there's like five people left, so there's only like a couple, a week or two delay. So if you want to do that, it's really easy to do, especially if you um, just read the poem as a, a voice memo on your on your smartphone. That always works really well, and it's pretty easy to do. And then uh, even if you're not here, like a lot of our callers are from London. Right now in London, it's something like 2 a.m. or so. Um, a lot of people call from Australia and places like that. And um, so if you can't watch live, but you still want to join in the open mic, that's all you have to do. And uh, let's see. Let's do one more poem just to, to see. I don't relate to that poem at all because we just had three feet of snow here in the mountains. And it's really early. You know, snow on Thanksgiving. 
Usually there's like flurries and a dusting. This was three feet. We were snowed out um, for several days and had to wait to come back home. So um, I guess maybe that's mad weather, though. That's mad, too. Just mad in the other direction. Uh, let's do another uh, Philip Hess, also pre-recorded a poem. This, this, this one I relate to a little more, where I am. Um, this is uh, First Snow. And um, uh, Philip Hess is from uh, Brixton, Indiana. And uh, that's all I have about him. So maybe he says more on the recording. All I listen to, I, I check out to see if the uh, sound quality is usable. And if it is, I just, just show it, just add it. So, so here's Philip Hess reading Brixton, in, or reading uh, First Snow. Hi, my name is Phil Hess. I live in Indiana, and I'm going to read a seasonally appropriate poem for the American Midwest called First Snow. This poem appeared in the online poetry magazine Vita Brevis. With online publications, poems can come and go pretty quickly, not unlike a light early snowfall. In this case, the poem was later selected as an editor's choice and so briefly reappeared before once again evaporating into the digital ether. First Snow For those who've never seen it, except in Erzot's forms and settings, as hoarfrost scratched from a failing freezer, or sodden mounds at an airport like a travel hangover's unyielding residue, or when tickling faces lifted smiling to the night in a holiday production, a light fury of frozen schmaltz. No, snow is what you see first thing after the deep dive, bobbing up from the womb of dreams into dawn's timid shapes, when you're most vulnerable, open to suggestion even, that the world outside is fungible, that color is only an oily liquid which can be siphoned away, that grass and trees can throw on a linen cloak of smoothest weave, as close-fitting as any swaddle, that what they said in school about forms of matter is transitive, how things can slip away when touched by light, like desert manna in the sun. And once again, that was Philip Hess from Brookston, Indiana, reading his poem, First Snow. Thanks so much, uh, Philip, for sharing that. Definitely appropriate. And, um, and thanks for introducing the poem, too. That's kind of, we want it to feel, even if you're not here, we want it to feel like you're here. So uh, I really appreciate the introduction. Uh, let's, let's go to um, the Skype open mic. But first, let me just remind you that uh, if you'd like to call in by phone, that's always an option now. You don't even need Skype anymore. The phone number is 818-850-7727. We did it last time, and it worked great. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you don't have Skype and would like to participate, feel free to do it that way. I'm going to call up uh, Joshua Corwin. Uh, he's a regular, so I know his Skype is going to work. Um, it's ringing for me. And uh, Joshua, you're not quite on yet, but... Um, Turn off your YouTube so I can add you to the stream. Click out of that window. Okay. Here you go. Okay. Okay, I'm going to pull you in just one second. Five. Four. Well, you're you're in now. So, um, hello. Oh, hang on a second. Just getting this fished out. It's a little... Oh, I, I locked it. Okay. You're, you're way too big. Your, your internet connection is too good, Joshua. You got to get on AT&T or something, which is not good. Okay, here we go. <laughs> So Joshua Corwin, hey, how, how's it going tonight? It is going great, Tim. Um, I don't see myself on. Um, well, you're here, though, so everything is good. Uh, I have your audio, I have your video, and I see your Cuba mug. <laughs> that is, can you see me now? I, no, I can see you fine. You're, you're on screen. Um, I don't know. Ah, okay. You're, you're good to go. So, uh, so you got your Cuba, Cuba cup. Is there, is there a significance to that? Are you going to read a Cuba yeah, poem? Yeah. I was just, uh, reading some stuff and, uh, actually I'm a very great multitasker. I was, uh, I have a bunch of submissions to a bunch of places coming in and was, uh, I lo love working with like local poets and was also, you know, watching the, the live feed and, you know, taking notes, you know, human size political 
poetry that was great by the way yeah that, that was great advice I, I was gonna say I you know that we have um, I'm writing a um i'm working on an epic uh poem that actually spans a chat book that is uh quite political and uh visceral and, and i'll keep that in mind uh, based on a, a line of uh uh, Hasidic analysis plus uh, based on some works of beat poets as well as Don Lundy Martin's, um, you know, uh, recent work that was nominated for the King's Tough Poetry Prize, which you, you got to check out. I was had the honor of hearing. But um, what I'm going to read for you guys is a poem that um, that actually was, I, I actually, uh, it was just recently published in Spectrum Publishing, Volume 21. Um, the theme was Who Won? Spectrum is a quarterly publication in Pasadena, California. So this was published November 30th, 2019. And in fact, if you happen to um, go ever to the Rattles Anything Goes Poetry Group, I happen to uh, take a picture of it because it's in print and put it online and that's okay. So if you ever want to see like Hmm, I wonder what it looks like. You can you can do that. Okay, so maybe um, I'll pull it up as you're as you're reading, and uh, we'll see if I can get there in time. Feel free, yeah. I do an interesting thing with slashes, so there you go. Okay, well, yeah, um, it's a it's a race. Ready, set, go. Winning, okay, oxymoron. Winning at the game of life. Losing at the game of life. Is winning, losing, living, dying? I don't know who I am. How do I, whoever I am, assuming I exist and there's any meaning at all, know what it means to win or to lose? Flowering sprinkles of decay Flowing, sprouting growth, empoisoned crackles of crimson, skies bright as forever not, colored with bleakness, black with shades of gray. Can you see the white? I can't. If you do, you realize it's a game. Perhaps you're the white. Perhaps you've lost it. Perhaps you're way too educated. Perhaps you're quite the opposite. And so you've never seen the black flowers with white sprinkles of decay. White flows sprouting black growth. Witnessed black bright skies as Forever white nothings. The whites colored the black bleakness, but the black whiteness introduced the shades of gray. They were neither white nor black. At least, that's what we thought, thinking we were winning. Bleak as black skies, Forever white with education not. Miseducation of white blacks itself out into thinking itself knowledgeable. Hence, the game of black and white, of winners and losers, of life and death, of true, false, true. Hence, the game of, I don't know. I don't know where that went. Do you? Well, thanks, Joshua. That uh, that worked great. I pulled it up. Um, it's a good segue yeah. too. Uh, well, not segue. A little, I don't know. Yeah. Plug. That's the word I'm looking for. If you're if you're a publisher and, yeah. and it's a good plug for uh, the Rattles Anything Goes Poetry Group, which uh, Joshua was a Very member cool. of. And if you'd like to share poems with other people who uh, appreciate Rattle, yeah. just uh, go to Rattles yeah. Rattles Facebook page and uh, click on groups. And we have I think five groups that you can join for workshops oh. and for Poets Respond for 
other things like that. And one of them is Anything Goes, where people just share poems. Um, and uh, congratulations oh, I, on that publication. That was Oxymoron yeah, from uh, from uh, Spectrum I Publishing. Yeah, and I, I, please submit. I believe there's going to be uh, another. It comes out again in the, uh, February, I think, or something like that. There's going to be another theme. Check it out on uh, Spectrum Publishing. I think they have a blog spot page. And also I have my full-length uh, poetry book about autism, addiction, sobriety, and spirituality that's going to be coming out next year sometime. So uh, thanks, Tim. Yeah, thanks a lot. Always good to see you, Joshua. Thanks again. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Yeah, so this is Joshua Corwin. Let's uh, let's try. Uh, we'll call up David. David Cook wanted to join us again too. Um, I'll give David Cook a call. Make sure the audio is on mute for now. Just calling up David Cook. Uh, David, um, um, uh, make sure you turn off your YouTube stream and. Um, if it's if it's not yet, and I'll pull you in right now. Um, uh, let me see, David Cook. Hello, good to see you again. Hello. Uh, and you're calling from uh, Portland, Oregon. I remember this time. Portland, Oregon. Yes. Yeah, and so, um, so, have you been a fan I, of uh, Naomi's for a while? I had no idea that uh, she was influenced by William Stafford. Early on, I. Um, I was trying to find poems for each of the holidays, like New Year's and Christmas and so forth, to put in my poetry box. And I um, would I found I came across uh, "Burning the Old Year," and that was quite perfect for a New Year's poem. So I'm going to be putting that in my poetry box this year mm. again. So, so what do you have to share with us tonight? Um, it is a, let me see if I can get this on camera. Um, it's a poem from uh, Motionless from the Iron Bridge, which is a Northwest anthology of bridge poems that uh, John Sibley Williams put out in oh, Bare Bone Books in 2013. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Bridge poems, huh? It's got uh, poems by Paul Ann Peterson, and um, who was the poet laureate of, uh, of uh, Oregon, and uh, David Bishbeel, who has a, uh, a poetry writing school in uh, Portland, and several others. Okay, great. great. Well, so let's hear it. I will turn it around so that you can see it, and let me see if I can bring this around so that I can read it because I can't. Well, that's okay if not. Why don't you just read it and we'll, uh, we'll watch you read it. Okay. 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 I'll uh, get my reading glasses this time. <laughs> okay, good idea. <laughs> wonder is a bridge. What is wonder but ecstatic confusion? Ignorance with an exit. Experience with an extension bridge vanishing into the fog. How tedious knowing is. The well-paved commute through the contours of orchards, undulating grid of vineyards, milestone after milestone. But wonder? Wonder is a bridge holding you over the void like the heels of your father's hands on your hip bones in the air. You can't see your drives are all bridges flanked by forests of Cambian geysers over roots divining the cosmic chaos, thonic oceans, Cambrian explosions. Don't look down. On bridges, the literal curtain between meal and gutter is gone. You can see what you believe is the vacuous current the bottom dropping out. It's okay. There are railings and trusses, though dizzy with fears, with breath in your throat. The air won't drop through the trap door in your lungs. Wonder is a bridge between known and unknown over what we cannot believe. 
Well, thanks so much, David Cook. That was yeah. uh, from, from my, what's the title of that one more time? I, I, I draw a blur. Motion, motionless from the Iron Bridge. Motionless from the Iron North Bridge. Iron Bridge, yes. Um, and it's got a picture of the Iron Bridge in Portland going over the Willamette ah. that my father actually fell out of his kayak under, which is another story <laughs> for another day. Is he, is he okay? <laughs> yeah, he's okay. Okay, that, but, that's uh, good. <laughs> I, I never, I never miss the, the kind of mention that. <laughs> okay, well, well, thanks so much for joining us again, David. It's always a pleasure to see you, and I hope you have a good rest of your night. Okay, great. I'll great. talk to you later. Yep, Thank bye. you very much for having this show. It's really done a great job for getting me to kind of get back on the horse again. Uh, that's awesome. That's really great to hear. I really, really appreciate that because that's what we're we're here for. So uh, thanks a lot. All righty. Good night. Have a good night. You too. Thank you, Tim. That was David Cook uh, um, reading uh, from the, the Bridge Anthology, which is really interesting. Uh, so we have one more. Uh, we have one more incoming call. Oh, I have an incoming call. Let's see who this is. Someone's calling on the phone. I'm answering. Oh, hi. Hello. Who is this? This is Carla Schwartz. I called last week, and I'm calling in again. Is it still time? Yeah, it's yeah, still- it, de- it definitely is. Thanks so much for calling again. I, you're the only, I, I always thought that um, people would be braver over uh, the phone than uh, Skype, but apparently you're the only one who's brave enough to call. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know why. But um, anyway, uh, if you want to, you can go to, again, my uh, CB99 videos Instagram. Mm-hmm. And uh, it would be the last poem that I published there called Lifeboat. Okay, uh, just one second. Oh, I got it. Okay. Let me just get and it on screen. That was, that was, sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That, yeah, so that appeared in, um, there is a, called the Florence Poets Society. They publish a journal it's either annual or biannual, and, and um, it's in print, and this was their survival issue, and there are a lot of good poems about survival. And this poem that I'm going to read to you is called Lifeboat. Oh, thanks so much. If not for a psychopath, and then young soldiers carrying out his orders, rifling through apartments, searching in closets, if not for a hamper large enough for my grandfather to hide in, if not for my grandmother, her years of escape planning, first shipping belongings, furniture, dishes for safekeeping, before ever leaving by foot, by train, by car, but not before witnessing the night of smashing, of burning, if not for their ship full of refugees, if not for the visas that permit my family to disembark in Cuba before those without papers were sent away, many to die, if not then for the confluence of the usual, I would not lie here rocking gently on the water, if not for a boat. Thanks so much. That was Carla Schwartz reading Lifeboat. And uh, you can see on the screen her... uh... Her her Instagram account is CB99 videos. Carla, let me ask, what is the significance of CB99? <laughs> That's a great question. It's also my YouTube channel and my Twitter handle. So there's three things. And it started out as my YouTube channel, CB99 videos. And um, I, I, there was once somebody in my life who called me Carla Beauty. But, um, <laughs> and so that was my CB. And, but I also had, um, had uh, my license plate at that time was also CB. So CB, and then 99 is just a good number, less than 100. And <laughs> <laughs> and it was my video channel. So it was CB99 videos was, uh, was my video channel, which is somewhat popular. I have uh, quite a few subscribers too. And, uh, and uh, some of the sum total of my videos which i haven't some totaled in a while have more than two million views oh my gosh well i'd say that's successful i think we have i don't know like a couple hundred or something (laughs) Uh, what kind of videos do you show 
it's uh, some of them are related to poetry, but um, and I have one that's very handy for poets. I will tell you, which is just uh, how to set the option in Microsoft Word for not capitalizing the first letter. Oh, of yeah. the first word of a line of a poem, which a lot of poets don't even realize that you have that option and they sort of blindly have the first line capitalized and they may not necessarily intend it. So anyway, I have one for that. But um, I also have a lot of instructional videos, videos about uh, going solar, you know, ways oh, that you might want to go solar. And um, in the summertime, I live in a sometimes in a solar powered houseboat, which is uh, the boat that was referred to at the end of this poem. Um, and so there are a number of videos about this houseboat, which is called uh, Wake with the Sun. And, uh, and it's a very cool boat because it's like a little tiny house built on a trailer that got then craned onto the boat and, and it has an electric outboard motor and the whole entire roof is solar panels and so it's 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 a kind of cool existence that I have, and um, and that is uh, some of the videos that I make that you can find on CB ninety nine videos. That is so cool. Well, thanks so much for calling in again. And it's Carla Schwartz. Thank that was her you. poem uh, "Lifeboat" and CB ninety nine videos. Uh, thanks so much, Carla. Take care. Bye bye. Yep. Bye. Okay, so I have one more pre recorded poem. Uh, but let me say one last time, if you'd like to call in, all you have to do is call, I don't know the number yet, you have to call 818-850-7727, or send me a quick chat message over Skype, we're going to do one last open mic poem, and then we will um, call it a night, unless anybody else wants to call in and join the open mic. So the last poem uh, for today, let me see, I have to find it again. Ah, okay, we started playing this earlier, actually. This is, um, oops, hang on a second. This is Partha Sarkar from West Bengal, India, reading The Face of the Fog. Uh, here we go. And, oh, I should say, uh, well, all I, have, all I have for him is that he writes from West Bengal, India. So um, we'll see if he introduces it a little more. But this is Partha Sarkar. At first, I wish to thank the editor for allowing me to reset the poem. And I am honored that I am allowed to reset the poems. The name of the poem, The Face of the Fog. I come down from the cliffs of the moon, from the post-mortem, from the graveyard, and go to the primary school, the desolate desert. I pant as there is no tree, there is no word of the dove. I ask the eagle whether it can bring any letter bloodstained, and it flies upward. I go up to the cliffs of the sun along with it, and give in to the white fume and I do not repaint as there should be no peace in the bedroom as there is the face of the fog in my morning lesson. There's a face of the fog in my morning lesson. Excellent poem. That's uh, Partha Sarkar from West Bengal, India. And it's great. I just think it's amazing that we get uh, people calling in over the open mic uh, from places like India. So thanks so much, uh, Partha Sarkar, for, for doing that. Uh, I think that's all for today. Um, let's see. I hope you enjoyed the show, though. And as always, if you enjoyed it, please do click the like button and share and um, subscribe if you're not subscribed yet. Uh, click the bell for notifications, all that stuff. I You know, everybody hates um, – well, I don't know if you hate it, but uh, people – I hate saying it over and over again, but it really is helpful if you do all that stuff. And uh, what we're trying to do is spread poetry around the internet instead of uh, all the other stuff that is not poetry. And things that are poetry are much better than things that are not poetry, in my opinion. So next week, we have uh, another excellent show. Rattlecast number 21 will feature Tony Glowigler. And Tony Glowigler is uh, one of the, the most frequently published poets in Rattle. 
Uh, we started publishing way back in like issue number 11 or something. Um, he has uh, his poem 1969, which you should Google if you're not familiar with. It's one of our most loved poems we've ever published. We published him about 10 times maybe over those 20 years. And uh, he's going to be reading from his newest book. I can't, I can't see it. It's over on my shelf. Um, but he's also going to be reading from um, an anthology called Alongside We Travel. And it's an anthology of contemporary poets um, on autism. So it's all people who um, um, have you know, autism affect their lives in some way. And we have the entire open mic next week is going to be poets from this anthology. So I have nine people lined up, I think, who already sent in audio. We're not going to take any other callers because we're just going to get through those. I'm not going to do any other pre-show. We're just going to focus on this um, really excellent anthology edited by Sean Thomas Doherty from NYQ Books, Alongside We Travel. And then we'll talk to Tony Glogler, whose last two books are about um, his ex-girlfriend's son with autism, who they have a close relationship with. Um, And so... We'll get to enjoy that next week. And once again, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, No matter where you're watching or listening, uh, please do click all those share and like buttons and tell your friends because that's how stuff spreads around. And in the meantime, I will see you next week. Good night.